Good morning, Sela Covenant. How are you guys doing this morning? Hey, good. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning if you are able. We are here. We are gathered together in so many ways to celebrate so many different things. We come to worship, to lift up the name of our Lord in this place, to make Jesus center of all that we do. We're coming this morning to receive from the Word of God. We've been journeying through the book of Genesis. We're going to wrap it up today. Aaron's got 25 chapters to cover, right? So have your Bibles out and be ready to go. <laughs> and we also have baptisms to celebrate at the end of the service, which we are so excited about. Uh, pray that the water stays warm for those people from the next hour or so. Um, but we are here. We are here to celebrate, to cry out, to lift up the name of Jesus. 
This first song that we're going to sing this morning is called Firm Foundation. What a way to start our worship, just to be reminded that Christ is the solid rock on which we stand. You spend any amount of time out in the world and you know that there's a lot of shifting sand. And so come this morning and set your feet on the rock.
Christ, the solid rock we stand, Lord, we come. Church, bring all that you are to Jesus. If you need healing, if you need comfort, if you're in pain, if you're struggling, if you're rejoicing, if you're dancing, bring it to Jesus. how we need you. Every day, every moment, every breath, we need you. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty river, come and fill me again. Come and
says when you lift up the name of Jesus that all men may know we lift up no other name the name above all names how great is our God amen amen we continue to worship and celebrate this morning God's just getting started with us kids right now we're going to invite you to kids ministry up through fifth grade your teachers are going to meet you in the back uh, and the rest of you we're going to invite you to turn and greet someone around you give them a handshake a high five Well, welcome. Kate and I are mixing it up. I'm standing on this side. She's standing on that side. Look at us. Took up a wild and crazy gals. Hey, this morning, uh, it is Palm Sunday, and so we celebrate the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And of course, we live on the other side of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we know, in fact, that he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and not some sort of political or whatever leader that they thought he was when they were welcoming him into Jerusalem, waving palm branches knowing that this guy, this king of the Jews, was coming into town. And now we reside on the other side of the death and resurrection, and the king of kings lives in us, and we rejoice in that. So a couple things this morning. This is just our time to let you know what's going on in the life of the church, just to help you see a little bit farther ahead uh, into the future of Sela Covenant. And so a couple things. You have your bulletin. Hopefully you got one when you came in this morning. Always information in here to take home and be reminded of. And inside, ah, we have the welcome card. And uh, we just want to invite you, everyone, to fill these out. Now, there's a few faithfuls. There's about 20 of you that fill it out regularly every week. Rock stars, gold stars uh, for all of you. Now, the rest of you, I'm talking to you. You know who you are. I want you to fill this out every week, and here's why. There's even a box on here that says, hi, I'm new here. 
even if you're new since we've been here, Aaron and I have been here for nine months now, even if you're new since we've been here, you're like, you can go ahead and mark that box. Like, that's okay. Uh, let us know because believe it or not, like there's still tons of you that we're still connecting with, getting to know names. Um, so fill out this card every week and turn it in. It's super helpful to us to let us know that you're here and then ways that we can connect with you because we do want to get to know Selah Covenant and um, all that calls Selah Covenant home. So you can fill this out, and at the end of service, there's a drop box right in between the two double doors, the glass doors in the back. You can put that in there. But on the back is a spot for praise and prayer requests as well, and there's a whole bunch of other boxes you can check. It's not just for scribbling on. I mean, it's, it's, there's actual information you can put on here. You can write praise and prayer requests, answers to praises and prayer requests that you've um, given us in the past. We as staff pray over these every week, and so you want to be prayed for? turn this card in. We pray for you anyway. That's just, you know, me trying to, I don't know what that was, okay? So we pray for you. But turn this in uh, as you leave here today. Um, today is also, you know, this isn't just for looks, right? We got some baptisms coming up at the end of service today. We're super excited about that. So, um, and our kids are going to come back and be joining us for that, and they're going to maybe end up in the splash zone. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, I'm just going to circle back really quick. Jackie mentioned gold stars. She actually has gold star stickers. So if you, like, need that extra incentive, I'm just saying, fill out a card. Come find us. We've got them on a I roll. I will give you a gold star. I mean. It's, it's just, worth it. It's, it's it worth, worth it. it. Um, but we are really excited. We are only four days away from leaving for the Mexico Woo! mission trip, which is really, really cool. Um, with that in line, we want to invite you guys to our prayer service. Um, usually we do a once a month prayer service. That would be the last Wednesday of every month. We are grouping it in with our send off service for the Mexico team. So we would love to invite you guys to come and celebrate with us. We'll worship. We'll do a little bit of a devotional. Um, and then we'll hoot and holler and take a picture and, and get in the cars and head off to Mexico and, just be expectant about what God is going to do. So that will be here at 630 on March 28th. So that's this Thursday. So mark your calendars in line with Mexico. If you ordered tamales, they will be here today, which is wonderful. We also Can need we to get an amen. Woohoo. Amen. Yeah. We also need to make sure that um, you pay the lovely people. So if you forgot that, if you need to like Swing out and grab some cash. Make sure if you haven't done that, you have your money for that. It'll be great. They are fantastic and really, really cool kids who are selling them, and we're really excited because they were kind of a last-minute addition. So God's answering prayers. We are really, really stoked about Mexico coming up. And then Good Friday. Pa well, Palm Sunday marks the beginning of what we call Holy Week. And if you look at the New Testaments, I would say like 75% of the New Testament scriptures that we have cover this one week of Jesus' life. That's how important it is. So uh, we got a lot of stuff to to be a part of that Holy Week and to remember what God has done. So starting with a Good Friday service, it is a collaborative service with Wiley Heights Covenant and Yakima Covenant, and it will be at Wiley Heights. Um, they've asked me to bring the little message this year, the devotional part of that, so I'm completely honored and excited uh, to be a part of that collaborative service. I want to invite you to that as well at 7 p.m. And then Saturday, the next day, we have our kids hopping egg hunt at 1 o'clock. And uh, so we want to invite you and your neighbors and your neighbor's neighbors and your family and your friends to come to that. It's not just about candy and eggs. It's about Jesus. But the candy and eggs are perk, yeah? Okay, so Jesus is going to be there. And actually, David's doing an incredible job um, putting all of this together so that we can bless our community and just share the love of Jesus. So, that, um, so get here for that event. Even if you don't have kids, nobody's going to judge. It's okay. Come, get some eggs. It's okay. Um, and then Easter. We have a sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. I've been watching the weather so far. No rain. Looks good, but dress warm. Uh, we're going to have a fire outside. We'll be uh, have a devotional time, and we'll be worshiping together just right outside here in the fire pit. And then we have our regular 9.30 a.m. service right here. It's going to be full, I hope. And so come in, sit in the front rows, challenge yourself. Sit in the front rows, <laughs> sit close together, um, and make room for those. But more importantly, be inviting people. This is a time of year when people are open to coming to church. And more importantly, we're not necessarily inviting them to see the cove. We want to invite them to Jesus to celebrate his death and resurrection and how he defeated sin and death. 
And so come uh, join us and invite people to join us as well. And that's what these are for in your bulletin. If you call Seal Covenant your church home, you've been listening to us talking about all the Easter stuff that's coming up. So you, you maybe know, you're like, come on, Katie and Jackie. I know Hop and Egg Hunt is the Saturday before Easter. But this is a great thing to pass off to someone that you're inviting. It gives them all of the information that they would need to show up to one of our services. Um, and like Jackie said, the heart isn't getting people to come to Seal of Covenant. Oh, we... We need you to be a part of this church. The heart is that they would give their lives to Jesus. And so that's our challenge to you this se season is to invite someone that you think needs to hear that truth um, and accept it into their heart. So last but not least, again, we're coming back to Mexico. We'll celebrate really big with Holy Week and all of the wonderful things going on the week after. So the Sunday after Easter Sunday, we will be back from Mexico and we will be doing our annual sharing service, which is super duper exciting. It'll also be a potluck Sunday, so it'll be very celebratory in nature because you will see a lot of extra families here that weekend, and so we would just encourage you, if you are planning on being here on potluck Sunday, maybe maybe bring your best dish because we will have a lot of people in this building. We're going to celebrate the awesome things that God is doing um, through our crew on the trip, and then Afterwards, if you want to stick around and help us clean, by all means, I'm, I'm inviting you to that as well. So, We're excited for all that God has been doing in us and will be doing in us as we continue on this morning and in this season of just life and ministry together. What a blessing it is to be a part of this church. We're going to invite up Pastor Aaron, and he's going to, we're going to wrap up Genesis, all 25 chapters today, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's a <laughs> news there was a typo not covering 25 chapters oh sorry uh, my fault I, uh, when I'm our sermon stuff I don't know why I'm sorry should I just grab a handle yeah I grabbed Jack's and turned mine off so we're not covering 25 chapters but we do have 50 chapters to cover because it's the last week. No. Well, if we have time, which I don't think we are, so Tom, fly with me. We may can't cut that summary at the end. But we are going to cover 14 chapters. Ready? Okay. So turn to uh, Genesis 37, and we're going to start reading. So Jacob settled in the land. Sir, get to your page. We got a, we got a lot to cover today. Okay. Uh, no, we're not going to read all of it either. I'm going to give us a quick flyby, and I think I'm still on, so I'm going to turn this off. We're going to kind of fly over some of this. But we've been going through Genesis, and we've been talking about kind of this Hebrew reading of things. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in, in, in reading through it from a Hebrew perspective is that a Jewish reader is not interested in the how and the why, but in the who and the what. And so pay attention to that as we kind of talk through some of this. And I really do encourage you, after this service, go home and read this story. This story, actually there's two, but it's kind of two stories tied together as one is the story of the life of Joseph. And in that, we're going to see that it's, there's also a parallel or a, a part of that where we need to look at Judah in this story as well. But we're going to kind of fly through these really close together. But in that, I also want to kind of prime the pump a little bit um, and give us an idea of what this story might really be about uh, in a real-world practical application kind of a thing. And it's about learning how to ride a bicycle. And uh, you've all learned how to ride a bicycle, right? Okay, if you haven't, that's okay. Um, but when you're learning to ride a bicycle, you get on the bicycle and you ride and then you fall over, right? And you may or may not get back up on the bicycle, right? So I have this story about my kids, uh, one of my kids. I won't mention any names so that Aaliyah is not embarrassed. Um, <laughs> she's learning to ride her bicycle and, or she wants, you know, she's got the training wheels on it. She comes to me one day and she goes, Dad. I want, to, I want to ride my bicycle. I just, just, I want to take the training wheels off. I was like, okay. So we take the training wheels off. And of course I said, okay, so, you know, we're going to do this. I'll hold on to this seat. You'll ride along. And of course, as parents, we, you know, we're going to ride and let go. She goes, don't let go. 
Don't do it. Okay. All right. I won't let go. It's okay, Elia. I won't let go. Just lied to my kid. But because we know we're going to let go. So sure enough, we go. And we're on the side of the house. And she starts pedaling along. And I kind of let go. And, and she rides a little ways on her own and kind of straight off into the grass. And then just falls over and lands. And she turns and she looks at me and goes, you let go. I'm done. You are not going to teach me how to ride a bicycle. I'm done. Next day we come out and she again comes up to me and goes, Dad, you let go. I want to ride my bicycle, but you're not helping me. I'm going to go learn to ride my bicycle. Okay, Aaliyah. Go for it. Now, a little bit about Aaliyah. Aaliyah is that kind of determined kid. If she wants to make something happen, she's going to make it happen. She's just that determined. Sure enough, not five minutes later, here comes this kid <laughs> pedaling all over the place. I'm like, what in the world? Now, I didn't see what she did, but I know how to learn how to ride a bicycle. I know she's around the corner. She fell over multiple times getting back up. Just get back on the horse, try it again, ride, ride on. I think sometimes that's what we need to understand about the nature of this life. And as we've read through Genesis, I think that's a similar theme that we have seen in how God actually interacts. Oftentimes we think of the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament, as this harsh, judging God. But as we really dive into these stories, we actually see that God is right there. He holds a high standard. He asks of us to live his story the way that he wants us to live. But when we fall, he kind of brushes us off and says, okay, let's do better next time. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. And I think that has something to do with these two ster- these stories. So we're actually going to start in, in chapter 37 is where the story of Joseph starts. And in 37, we hear all about Joseph. He's this 17-year-old punk twerp who gets this extra coat from his dad and then goes parading around in front of his brothers with it and runs back and tattletales on his brothers about what all they're doing to dad. He's really making points with his brothers. They really like him. They hate him. And by the end of the chapter, what we read is they hate him so much they plotted to kill him. And instead of killing him, they decided, hey, there goes some slave traders. Let's make some money off this deal and sell him into slavery. Right? Joseph's not a real popular figure in this story. He doesn't do a whole lot of things right. It's kind of, he is. He's just kind of this cocky, arrogant jerk. He even tells this story of these dreams that he had where the family will come and bow down to him. Even his dad chastises him. Not a real good look kind of a thing. And then we go from that, and all of a sudden there's this weird twist because we we have this story of Joseph, and then the next chapter is the story of Judah and his family. Judah is the oldest brother of Jacob, and one of the older brothers. I I can't remember if he's the oldest or if Reuben's the oldest right now, but... He's one of the older brothers. We have this story of Judah. Now, from a Jewish reader, again, it's like, we, if there's something that goes, wait a minute, that's weird. Why did we go from Joseph to Judah? Because we also read ahead a little bit. We see that we jump back to Joseph. So this story of Judah is kind of stuck in the middle. To a Jewish reader, they're going to go, okay, I need to pay attention There's something I need to know about these two individuals. Again, the the what and the who. Right? So as I'm reading, I'm going to pay attention to these guys. So we have this little story about Judah and his family. And this story of Judah is not a very flattering one either. We've talked about Abram and his character and the quality of character that he is and looks out for the vulnerable and isn't about making a name for himself. And he is... When he does fail, he dusts himself off and doesn't define himself by his failures. But here's Judah, and he does all kinds of things. His sons don't live up to 
the character of looking out for the vulnerable. And God says, if you're not going to do that, I'm going to kill you. And so he kills their, his sons because they didn't live up to their duty of taking care of their sister-in-law, who was a widow. And not only that, Judah doesn't really help her out either. And then there's some really crazy, nefarious stuff that goes on, and she pretends to be a prostitute, and Judah sleeps with her, and she gets pregnant, and not at all the character of Abraham's family in this little story of Judah. So it's like, what in the world? This is kind of weird. But as we begin to continue, again, from a Jewish reader, it says, okay, here's these two stories. They're, power, they're right next to one another. This one seems to kind of be out of place. We need to pay attention to these two, who and what they are about. And so we begin to read on. Chapter 39 then flips back to the story of Joseph. Change my page here. Joseph, 39 through 41, is the story of Joseph. Joseph is sold into slavery. He ends up in Potiphar's uh, household. Potiphar was this big Egyptian uh, official. Wasn't the pharaoh, but he was up there in rank. And it says that while he was in Potiphar's house, God was with him. And he earned favor with Potiphar and became the head servant over all of Potiphar's affairs. And then there's this part of the story where a coat comes involved and Potiphar's wife takes notice of Joseph and thinks, hmm, he's kind of young and handsome and grabs his coat to try and convince him to do some not so good things. But this time, instead of holding on to and being proud of his coat, he lets his coat go and runs. Right? He runs away from her as she is trying to seduce him and leaving his coat behind. Only for her to then lie and, pot and pot to Potiphar and Joseph end up in prison. But he lets go of his pride, his coat, in many ways. Ends up in prison. And it says, in prison, God was with him. There's something that's changing. God's with him in Potiphar's house, and he rises up in prison. The same thing happens. God is with him, and the jailer puts him over everything. And he becomes in charge of all the other prisoners. And then there's this story about dreams. Remember he had those dreams where he was bragging about himself? Well, in this story, all of a sudden, there's dreams too. So Joseph, what's going on with Joseph? This is the reading that we're asking. What is happening? He let go of his coat instead of being proud of his coat. He starts to interpret these dreams, and instead he's, he's in jail, and these two uh, other prisoners come up, and they say, we had these dreams. He interprets their dreams. One of them wasn't such a good interpretation. The baker, uh, who was Pharaoh's baker, uh, was in three days going to go before Pharaoh and was going to be executed. But the cupbearer was going to go before Pharaoh and be restored to his position. And sure enough, they came true. But in the first story of Joseph, we see him bragging about himself in his dreams. And in these stories, he recognizes and acknowledges that it is God who interprets the dreams. He deflects. He his character seems to have changed. Even to the point that the story goes on, and the cupbearer was supposed to remember Joseph, and he doesn't, so Joseph's still sitting there in the prison for a while. Um, there's a, another thing we can learn from Joseph's story about waiting. Um, I hate the story of Joseph and waiting, but he teaches us a lot about waiting, and he's waiting, and finally, Pharaoh has this dream, nightmare kind of a thing. He's looking for interpreters, and the cupbearer says, hey, I know a guy that can do that. And so Joseph comes before Pharaoh and interprets Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh says, if you know that, I'm going to put you in charge of taking care. Pharaoh's dream was that there was going to be a famine. That's not what he dreamt. He dreamt about cows that would eat each other and corn stalks that would eat each other and all this kind of stuff. And Joseph says, that means that there's going to be famine in the land and we need to prepare. You need to prepare. And so Pharaoh makes him in charge of that preparation. God was with him in the midst of this. His character changed. He, in front of Pharaoh, says, it is not me who divined 
what your dreams meant. It was God. It was the one true God. Again, there's a shift in how he uh, approaches these dreams. He gives God credit instead of, look at me and my, you're going to come and bow down before me attitude. Right? What about Judah? That's kind of 39 through uh, 43, but what about Judah? Judah changes as well. I've lost track in my notes. 44. No. I'm sorry. I have completely lost track of my notes. Judah. That's okay. I can wing it. Judah comes. Where do we see Judah? Judah enters this story now. The famine has spread. It's not just Egypt, but the famine has spread to Canaan. And now all of a sudden, the, fa- the other part, sorry, part of the family comes back into the story. And they're facing this starvation. And we see Judah say, we need to protect the family. We need to preserve the family. He was the one who was ready to kill the family, didn't really care about anybody else but himself. Now all of a sudden, he's trying to figure out how do we preserve the family. He says, let's go down to, Ju- to, to Egypt and get some grain. They go back and forth. In this exchange, we see a change in Judah's character. Now, instead of not caring about his family and protecting them and preserving them, he takes steps to protect and preserve his family. Not only that, when they get down there, they run into this guy who's in charge of all the grain and things like that. They don't know who he is, but it happens to be Joseph. Joseph plays some tricks on him and things like that and tries to get them to bring the little brother back. There's a little brother that had come along that now was dad's favorite instead of Joseph because he, dad thought Joseph was dead. But Judah's attitude towards this favored little brother is different. He willingly puts himself both in front of his father. He says, I will protect him with my life. I will lay down my life for this little brother. This favored little brother. Unlike the favored Joseph, now Judah is protecting him. Now Judah is preserving him. There's a change in Judah's uh, behavior and things like that as well. Instead of being about himself, he does look out for the vulnerable. He leads the family to survive, self-sacrificing, and thus vow to protect his brothers. There's a change in their character. The who and the what. They're not perfect at it. They wrestle with it. It comes down to, though, as the story continues, we see these changes, and now all of a sudden, Joseph reveals himself. It's been 33 years. Joseph was, since uh, Joseph had these dreams as a teenager. Again, I said there's some things about waiting for promises to be fulfilled. But he reveals himself. He is now second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. And his family does come and is saved because he is in that position. They come and bow before him. And he reveals to them, what you intended for evil, God has turned out for good. He has turned and made it that way. But not only has God turned that... We, we notice that God changed them. There's a turn in their character. There's a turn in their behavior. When we're reading these scriptures, one of the things that we have to do is we have to see those things. Again, from a Jewish standpoint, the who and, and, and what. Joseph and Judah. A, a, a teenage twerp and a self-absorbed old brother becoming caring, soft taking on the characteristics of their ancestor Abraham who God saw those things in Abraham and says I want to partner with them what is this Genesis thing? When we're reading and interpreting scripture one of the things we have to do is we have to know who is it written to and what is it telling them then we can figure out what does it mean for us. And Genesis is one of these stories. I think it ends with this because 
This book is a story. This book is a book that is written to a Jewish people. It's written to an enslaved people. This is an origin story. Moses is writing, has, it's attributed to Moses' authorship, and he's writing to the nation of Israel who has just come out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. This is how they got to Egypt. We're going to pick up the rest of the story later this fall when we look at Exodus. But this is God telling them, this is, this is who you are. And this is how I want you to be my chosen people. This is how I want you to be the ones who will bless the nations. Trust my story. It starts in Genesis 1. And we are, we're not going to have time to watch the, uh, I put together a little video thing. Go to the Bible Project and watch the compilation videos on Genesis. They give you this summary. But Genesis 1, God comes and says, trust my story. You're not, a, you're not valuable because of what you can produce, the bricks that you can make. You are valuable to me because I created you. Don't let sin get in the way. Don't let it interrupt our lives. This is how it interrupts our lives, and we see it continue over and over and over. But then he comes and he says, but I'm going to make it right. We're going to do this differently. How do I see this? There's two passages really quickly. God says, get up, try, try, and try again. He's not asking for our perfection. All the way back in Genesis chapter 4, story of Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve have sinned. They have two boys. Cain comes out. Cain offers a sacrifice. Abel offers a sacrifice. Cain's is not accepted. Cain gets upset. What does God say? Just get up and do what's right. It's okay. It wasn't acceptable. God doesn't lower his standard and say, oh, I'll, I'll accept it now. He still holds that, and he says, I have a standard that I want you to meet, but get up. Let's do it again. Get back on the bicycle. Let's do it again. And I think we see that again in the story of Joseph and Judah, but we see it especially with Joseph as he repeats re over and over, the Lord was with Joseph, and he has succeeded at everything he did. He served in the home of his Egyptian master. But a little bit later, and the Lord was with Joseph. This journey that we're on, the message of Genesis, really is to a people that God is pursuing us. He is after us, and he wants to change us. He wants to transform us. He wants us to trust his story and come back to the way that he designed it and created it. But he's going to be right there, and he's not going to let go. He's going to teach us how to ride the bike, but he's going to do it perfectly. It's one of those, I was sitting there as we were singing this morning. I, we don't sit and talk about what we're preaching on. But it was interesting to me to hear that theme in the songs that we were singing this morning. I'm calling on the God of Jacob. The faithfulness of God to be in the, with us in the midst of our lives as we're walking through these things. It's part of why we as a church are here. It's not part of, I think it's why we as a church are here. Especially here at See the Covenant, we say our vision for See the Covenant is to, we the church exist to see lives transform through the power of the Holy Spirit, whose God is right there with us in this, into fully devoted followers of Christ. As Jackie preached last week, that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect at it. It means we're going to wrestle. We're going we're gonna to fall down. We're going to get back up. We're going to carry one another. We're going to lean on one another. But God is at work in us to transform us. We're at Palm Sunday, and we're celebrating the Christ is headed to that cross, which makes this way back. He's headed to the cross to pay for my sin, for my mistakes, for the things that I did, those sins that I can't even atone for. I can. The wages of sin is death. But he takes that on himself. He's with us. He's in this. He's going with us. This, I think, is the story of Genesis as we read through this. 
It was to a people who were beat down and broken. And God says to them over and over and over, but you're my creation. I love you and I will make you new again. Let's keep going. And I think it plays out as we see how the nation of Israel continued as they sinned and they went into exile. And where was God? He was right there and he brings them back. And they sin and he brings them back. I think that's the story. We don't have time. I, I really do encourage you, go back, uh, Bible Project, you can Google it, BibleProject.com. We have some links in your bulletin as well, some supplemental stuff. But get this overarching picture of all of the narrative of Genesis. Because scripture is one big narrative. I was having a conversation with somebody this week, and we were talking about, well, if it's one big narrative, then was, doesn't it all flow together? I said, it's kind of like Star Wars. Right? Now, this person didn't fully comprehend Star Wars, which is probably a good thing. I probably spent too much time in it, right? But there's the story of Star Wars. Actually, this person understood the Harry Potter world a little bit better, right? There's the story of Harry Potter. And then there's these stories, these books that help us tell this bigger picture. This is what Scripture is doing for us. And so we need to grasp these stories. We need to grasp who wrote it, to whom did they write it, what were they telling them so that we can understand what it means for us. So go back and get that overarching story of Genesis. But we do get to celebrate today. We get to celebrate that Christ came, that he is alive and doing this work. As much as we're saying Genesis is about God was there, that's what we're celebrating in baptism. We're celebrating that God is at work in our lives. Um, I didn't watch the video, but I'm going to say this. The baptism really is, it's a sacrament. What do we mean by sacrament? Sacrament means that it is an act that we do that represents two things. It's an act that we do. It's a, a, a ritual that we do, but it, it also celebrates something that is actively happening within us. We say this when we talk about communion. Communion is a remembrance back to Christ's death, but it also is an act of saying, God is coming into my life. I am taking him in, and he is making me new. Baptism is a similar sacrament. It's a celebration of decision that was made to follow him. And then I am choosing to die to myself and to be raised to new life in him. It's an active thing that the Spirit is doing in us, not just being dunked in the water or sprinkled on, on your head. We're celebrating that because God is with us. We do have a little video that we're going to show to... Sorry, I'm getting direction. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a little... Jackie's going to come back up, and the worship team is going to come and continue to lead us in this service. We want to give our kids some time to get in here uh, as well. So, uh, Al, maybe if you could let the, the kids know in the classrooms that they can head back in. I want to invite you to stand uh, if you are able. And uh, we're going to continue to worship and prepare our hearts and let those that are being baptized, um, this is your time to go ahead and go back and get ready, grab your towels, uh, get ready for that. But um, we are still in this posture of receiving, this posture of worshiping. So I'm going to invite Katie just to talk to us a little bit about offering, which is one of the ways that we worship God as well. And then we're going to sing and get ready for baptisms. Yeah, just like Jackie said, um, offering and, and giving of our time, giving of our resources, giving of our money specifically as we talk about a tithe and an offering is just one of the ways that we worship God um, and give him full trust. Uh, one of the songs, the song we're going to sing next is called Unstoppable God. Um, and just as I reflect over 
this period of fundraising for this mission trip, there's always the question like, okay, we have 40-ish participants. They each need to pay $600. We need to make sure, and that's like, that's actually a very, very stringent budget to make food stretch, to buy the supplies for the house or things like that. So you always have this question of, all right, how are we gonna do it? And the reality is, is that like one, it, it's just being faithful and asking God, like, God, what do you wanna do? How do you want to, uh, us to approach this? Um, but as a, we have invited you into that journey as we've invited you um, just to, to step forward and bake breakfast bread and to come to an auction and bid on things like pies and things like that, you guys have been incredibly generous. And I know that comes from a place and a heart of understanding that God is unstoppable. That it doesn't matter that 40 people have to raise $600 to make this trip happen, to make sure that a home is built, um, but that you are just believing that God is faithful and that like what we look at as a blockade, God absolutely blasts through that with no, like no, no trouble at all. It is so easy to him. Um, and so this morning, I would encourage you, if you call Sila Covenant your church home, the challenge is asking God, like, God, how can I be faithful to what you are calling me to, how you're asking me to give, not just of money, but of my time? How do I take that extra step with you? Um, if you call, if, like I said, if you call Seal of Heaven at your church home, but if you're a guest here, please feel no pressure to give. Um, like Jackie said, we're going to continue to worship, and so I'm going to pray, and then we would just invite you to join us. So, Lord, thank you that you are unstoppable. Thank you that you are infinitely bigger than we could ever imagine, that you do amazing things from absolutely nothing. God, you breathe life into everything around us. So Jesus, we just give you this time. We give you our worship, Lord. We thank you for your sacrifice, God, and we, we celebrate you. Palm Sunday, this idea, like, it was a parade for you, your triumphant entry. How amazing and special it is that we get to stand before someone who loved us so much that he sent his son to die. So Jesus, thank you for that. We love you and we worship you. Amen. All right, we learned this song last week together. The chorus, you can sing in English or in Spanish. We come together to worship. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you born. Faith commanded and the mountain moved. Fear is losing ground to our
You may be seated. When someone decides to follow Christ, their life is changed forever. Death turns to life. Despair changes to hope. Dark becomes light. It's a deep, quiet moment that could easily be kept hidden. But a change this profound can't stay a secret for long. It's time for the world to see what God has done. For we were once in darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. Baptism is an act of faith. It's a celebration, a beacon cutting through the fog, a message to the world that a lost cause has been redeemed, that God is here and he is transforming lives. So embrace this moment. Declare his glory and let your light shine. We have two baptisms this morning.